thank you very much for being here. Um, tell us about your current work at Airbus. Okay, well I'm uh, working on uh, future missions at Airbus. And these are future space missions which are going in all sorts of directions. Some of them are to do with um, astronomy, going to other planets as well. Um, but others are looking at our own planet, looking at uh, providing information on the state of our planet, on climate change, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, the change in forests around the world. So it's a real mixture between, you know, the, the science that is out there and the science which is supporting understanding our planet. What are the breakthroughs that you're most excited about or that are uh, in the pipeline? Well, you know, it's probably more about how to deal with the huge amount of data that we are generating, whether it's data on the universe or data on, on the Earth, and to be able to use that effectively. I, I mean, this is something that affects so many different areas of life these, these, these days, but it for sure affects us dealing with satellites in orbit around the Earth or going to other, other planets because they're generating vast amounts of data and we want to use the information, access that information and use it in the most effective way. What are the ethical challenges? Well, there's surely practical challenges about uh, collecting and organising data, but what are the ethical challenges um, that you encounter in a project like that? Um, I think it's, it's ensuring that what we're doing is actually connected to the reality of decision making. It's all very well to be watching our planet develop, um, doing interesting things, storing away the data on, as I said, things like how forests are, are developing or, or, or changing, or how carbon dioxide is being emitted in different parts of our, of our world. Um, it's important that that work is not done in some engineering or scientific bubble, but that it has actually got a real meaning for us, for our decision makers, and for the information we put to use about our, our planet. So how do you create a system, a process, or an organisation that achieves that? Well, I think you have to be aware of how things are done already. That you, the new boy on the block, these clever stuff from space, um, actually recognises the effort that's been put in, whether it's through organisations like the United Nations or, or other fora, um, and that you are plugging in with the people who've been trying to do this using tried and tested methods and trying to influence governments and trying to get things changed in the way we're managing our, our planet. So that is where I would say the, the, the ethics kind of comes into it. Okay, can we talk about uh, one specific future mission um, to do with space travel? Yeah. Okay, so broad question, how likely is it um, that we'll find life on Mars? I can't give you any probabilities. The reason for that is we only know of one set of life, as it were, and that's what we find on Earth. And as far as we know today, or everything we know on Earth that's living has one common ancestor. That doesn't mean that life didn't evolve multiple times, but it, all it means is that what we can see today, what remains today that we can detect, all has a common ancestor. Now, that gives I me mean, no basis for understanding the probability of finding life anywhere else. But we can speculate a little bit about what helped in the conditions on the early Earth with the, the evolution of life, the start of life. And we can start to chip away at the problem by looking at conditions on other planets, like Mars, like the, the, the moons of uh, Jupiter or moons of Saturn, like looking into, I mean incredibly, looking into the atmospheres of planets around other stars even. So we can take some logical steps, but I can give you no probabilities because we have only found life once. What lessons um, learnt from space travel, exploration and science can be applied back home? Um, there are obviously technologies which are, uh, are applicable in what we do and uh, I tend to mix up quite deliberately the work that I do looking outwards into the universe with the work I do looking back towards the Earth because so many of the technologies are very much the same. 
Um, are there things we can we, we can learn? I've I've seen scientists developing sophisticated instruments for the detection of maybe biochemical processes on the planet Mars, which actually have real applicability on Earth, real commercial applicability for the way in which um, solvents can be applied to different problems because they've had to think so much out of the box to do something so cleverly on the surface of Mars with so few resources on a spacecraft which is so far away that having solved that problem you know you can bring that back to Earth to, to think about some of the, the things you would do with that equipment back on back on Earth. Um, things like um, almost sniffing, sniffing for evidence of um, diseases let's say. So if you've got something that is sniffing very carefully for gases and things on another planet, its applicability on the earth to health checkups, things like that, suddenly it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting connection because you've had to solve such a difficult problem in space. What are the values that guide your work personally or have guided your career up to this point? I think, to be, to be honest, it's mainly the excitement of what we're doing and the, the, the impact, the fact that through the work that I see doing, led by scientists and actually put in place by engineers like one of my colleagues at, at Airbus, um, it's actually building things which are um, adding to our knowledge, um, both fundamentally about what this universe is that we've come into being with, um, some of the big questions, which we still haven't solved, about life, um, and also about how our own planet functions. The amount of information we are building up, which is giving us a, a better understanding of just how our own planet functions. I find that hugely, hugely motivating. Have concerns about climate change affected the aerospace industry? Yeah, I, absolutely they, they, they have. I mean, in, in, in my case very particularly, because I'm in the world of being able to contribute to the understanding of climate change. And that's kind of, kind of unique and that's fantastic. Um, but of course, the aerospace industry has to deal with climate change as, um, as a contributor to it and as um, an organisation which has to deal with the impacts of it. So any big industrial organisation has to face up to the fact that its, its infrastructure will be affected in the future by climate change. And any um, industry which has got an element to do with transport, in my case it's to do with aircraft, Airbus, um, has to deal with the fact that it is also a contributor to, to climate change. So it's a very interesting, complex sort of um, uh, situation for the aerospace industry. How is Airbus going about um reviewing its contributions to uh, carbon emissions and to climate change? Well, it's doing a lot of work at the moment on non-hydrocarbon fueled planes. Now, that will not be a solution to everything, but for certain classes of travel, having uh, electrically powered uh, planes, battery powered planes, actually is a workable solution. So it's something which um, has really sort of come to the fore this year, it's starting to be, to, to be de demonstrated and rolled out. So I think that's, that's one of the, the ways in which it's responding. But some of the fundamentals are still about burning hydrocarbons. Um, what's the timeline for that project? for the, the new um, non-hydrocarbon based? Uh... Well, I, I can't speak for, uh, for the aircraft part of, uh, of Airbus, that's, uh, that's a huge enterprise, but uh, we rolled out um, demonstration um, uh, things at the Paris Air Show this year. So this year is a big year for telling the world about the potential of non-typical fuel based planes. And what are Airbus's plans for the future? I mean, as head of future missions, probably the first to go to. But what maybe what are you most excited about that Airbus has got in the pipeline? I, I think it's it's a it's a kind of combination of things. It's about the long-term operational contributions that spacecraft are now making. We're building spacecraft which will be operating now, um, contributing to weather services, climate services between now and the 2040s. This is not, these are not simple experimental missions. These are things which will be part of our infrastructure um, for decades to, to come. 
But at the same time, trying to look at new ways of doing things, looking at how you can use, um, if you like, cheaper, smaller uh, ways of doing things to demonstrate new techniques very quickly, to, uh, to take new ways of sensing the Earth or looking into space, helping astronomers. Um, it's that mixture which I think is very exciting now. Great. And when do we make it to Mars? What do you mean by we? This is the big question. <laughs> when does one? When, does, when will someone? Uh, or, uh, when will a human make it to Mars? Probably part two. When will... Yeah, actually, no. When will a human make it to Mars? OK, I think that's, that's quite tricky to, to answer. We've got some fantastic and really important robotic missions lined up to go to Mars. Ones which are going in the very near future, like ExoMars, looking for signs of past or present life. That is due to be launched next year, in 2020. And then missions which will actually bring back bits of the planet Mars. And that's really important, because if you can bring things back and put them in Earth-based laboratories, you can, as, as techniques improve on Earth over the decades, you've got bits of that planet to, to, to analyse in detail. So that will be very important. The next step, humans to Mars. Well, I've got my personal concerns about that, um, because Mars, I think, is a very precious place whether or not it has any signs of life on it. And I, would think, I, I feel that humanity needs to think very carefully before it tries to send astronauts to the surface of, of Mars. Of course, it makes the idea of exploration a lot easier. Certainly today, uh, a, an astronaut can be much more flexible than a machine can. But I must say, machines are, are catching up quite, quite fast. Um, but you're right, I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of imperative. People do want to explore. They do want to put um, human beings on, on other planets. But I would be loath to put a date on, on that. I see that as being something a long way into the future. It is very difficult to land on Mars. It is very difficult to take off from Mars. Um, this is a far more difficult enterprise than even going to the moon was at the end of the 1960s. Do you think exploration as a word puts a bit of a gloss on it and it is in fact a form of colonisation? No, I don't think at the moment. I think exploration is what it, it says. It's, it's a kind of, um, um, both at a personal level and the excitement to go and explore, and I think that's, that's intrinsic in so many of us, um, linked with a kind of a political will to demonstrate capability and to plant flags I think it's though that that kind of combination is is what it's about. Um, so yeah, I'd call it it's, it's exploration, but with with various motivations for it. And what would happen if, with this mission in 2020, um, we do find life? You know, if if and when the Queen dies, there's Operation London Bridge, and all sorts of things are rolled into place across the media and politics. Is there is there something similar in place for if if we find life? Is, like, what happens? I think that's really interesting because um, if we do find signs of life or past life, I mean, it's likely to be extremely primitive. These are not going to be little green men that we, we, we find on, on Mars. So I think everyone has to ask themselves, how long would the media excitement last? And there would be excitement, I'm, I'm sure there would, but would it last very long before it's replaced by you know, some other story? I'm, I'm slightly depressed to think about that, but I, I fear that that would be the case. Um, in the scientific world, yes, it would be hugely exciting, but to everybody else, I'm not quite so sure. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Um, thank you, Ralph, so much for your time. You're very welcome. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.